Thank you all for your flexibility. It is a Saturday. It has been two weeks of excitement, uh, a lot of work, uh, people getting, having all kinds of things come up. You're going to hear an incredible journey today, and we're so excited to have you here. So I just want to give a little background for those of you who don't know me or don't know a little bit of the background of Island 17 is that how did we come how did we come to deciding we wanted to create a meta, a metaverse to solve the world's greatest problems well we've actually been working on this for 5 years now with groups of young people who have come through our program in dream tank so in 2016 i had already been working in the impact investing social enterprise world for 14 years now it's 19 years um and um uh, and basically what I saw was in working in impact investing, I was at UBS, I worked at all different organizations that were leveraging all the different types of asset classes for change and to create portfolios that were both profitable and impactful and aligned with people's purpose. Uh, at the same time, I had kids and I have younger kids. Now they're 14 and 17. But at the time, they were really sharing and looking at the world in different ways and saying such incredible imaginative things. Whenever I would go travel around the world to do my social impact work, they would have such insightful things. And that led me to create Dream Tank. And Dream Tank, my first mission with Dream Tank was what if we listened? to kids. I started with the word kids and I expand to youth to be politically correct. <laughs> but what if what if we listen to kids ideas on how to solve the world's problems? And what if we actually gave them such a fun way to do it and self-motivated that we could really get out of their way and, and see what they could come up with? Uh, since we haven't fully figured out our, you know, you know, our problems, let's give them a chance. They have the best minds and for creativity. And so as we were doing Dream Tank, uh, it was a, basically a social impact accelerator. And we would always start with what's the most passionate thing? What's the thing that brings you joy? And we start with kids youngest, as young as eight, all the way to young adults up to 28. And one of the things that many of them said, now this was pre-COVID, um, things have definitely changed um, and we've evolved with it and pivoted to have this, uh, this place where we are now. But one of the things is that they love gaming and we started seeing that kids could create social impact games and that they were thinking of things differently than anyone else I saw anywhere trying to innovate for the sustainable development goals. And so what we decided to do was during COVID, we had a hackathon. We've done a whole series of different accelerators and hackathons to test this model. And at the same time, I saw a video, a TEDx talk by one of our advisors and DAO members, Yukai Chow, who uh, helped me set up our very first hackathon in 2017 to test this idea. And he talks about how gamification can really improve our world because gamers, even with no background in the thing that you think you need to know in order to solve the problem, for example, PhDs could not solve an AIDS protein problem for 15 years. They uploaded a data set into a game. A gamer with no medical background in 10 days solved that. So that blew my mind. And at the same time, um, young people and my son included were innovating around games. And so the whole idea of a metaverse came up where we decided, what if we actually build our whole accelerator into the game as well? So people could ultimately all collaborate and solve problems in a fun way without consequences in the real world uh, because they're testing and sandboxing in a game. So ultimately, the all each island, um, each SDG, each sustainable development goal will have its own island. And just imagine if you were in a room with all the biggest thinkers and the biggest funders, all who want to solve no poverty. 
I've organized these types of collective impact uh, events um, in Davos, at the United Nations, and at the White House over my years to leverage capital, purpose, innovation, all in one group and have people come up with moonshot goals together and then solve them. Uh, so the islands are going to be the big collective impact zones where you can propose all kinds of exciting things and find the best ideas to partner with, fund, scale, and get massive satisfaction by doing that along with your family and leaving a legacy for the next generation. Um, really being able to connect with your own children and children in your own lives on something that matters to all of us. So <laughs> we, I'm a Brown University alumni myself. I grew up in uh, New Jersey in middle-class uh, household. Uh, my father was born in Italy in 1939. My mother was born in Germany in 1939. And actually, she was a refugee from East Prussia, which is now Poland. So I'm very connected to sustainability. My father lived on a, subs on a subsistence farm. That word is always hard to say. And my mother, as a refugee, had to make do with everything, anything that they had. And that's in my roots. And so I'm, I feel very close to the ground. And I did, would never imagine I could go to a school like Brown. I was just with my Italian family in New Jersey, going along, doing my thing, swimming, getting good grades, just being excited about everything. And someone in my life said, you should try to go to Brown and an Ivy League school. And so I applied to Brown and Yale based on someone else's belief in me, got into both and chose Brown. Why? Because and Brown, to me, felt like I was welcome there. I felt like everyone was welcome there. Not that Yale is not, it was my choice because I felt a big hug when I stepped on the campus and that has led to much of um, what you what I've done in the world. But really since Brown, the confidence that any amazing education that anyone's recommending for you that allows you to unleash your dreams no matter where you are matters. So uh, I had the privilege of having the second annual two-week winternship sprint. Last year, my alma mater reached out at Brown and asked, "Could you? would you like to have some uh, uh, interns over winter break? And they pay them. They, they create a stipend for a number of students. Uh, most organizations only get one. Uh, we got to have a lot more, which was very exciting because there was so much interest in this program. And even one of our winterns from last year came back this year uh, because they had such a good experience. And we began building this game last year. And, um, and now on the second one, we're starting to build more and we're continuing with this amazing group. And every day, what we did in this two weeks is we really wrap in personal development along with those tools that one needs and mindfulness to achieve a thriving future. So every single session, uh, we had a different guest speaker, we had a different mentor doing a little mini um, talk about something such as overcoming fear, tuning into your, your intuition, to connecting through the vibration and frequency of water, uh, all kinds of amazing sessions by different guest speakers and members of our DAO. And we did a gratitude practice every day. We had every day we took one minute to text, call or email somebody that we wanted to be grateful for in our life. And that really kept incredible joy, I feel like, and resonance in our group. And also had daily coaching and mentoring with office hours and different mentors helping for different areas. Um, the winterns divided up into three different groups. And we are going to introduce the winterns now and they will tell you more about their groups and a little bit about them. And uh, I'm gonna introduce, start with Yabek, who is our team lead for this cohort. Hello everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Heidi. Um, so yeah, my name is Yabek Zeik. I'm a sophomore at Brown University studying computer science and economics. And for this two week uh, sprint, I was on the survival team and we created a game uh, surrounding the survival SDGs that we'll get into in a bit. Um, but just a little bit about me. I'm from Washington, D.C., um, first generation American here. So my parents immigrated from Ethiopia um, and I chose to work on the survival game 
just because um, I believed in like the idea of gamifying the process of learning things and educating yourself um, through games and having the youth learn through this um, through this process and use what they learn in the game to apply to real world action. Um, and yeah, I enjoyed the time that I had working on the game. It was definitely um, fun. And I, I learned a lot when it came to game development and working in a team. I had a, a really great team with Eric and Ruth on the game. Um, and it was really enjoyable. And we, we came with a good product and I'm excited to show it to you all. Um, so next I'll pass it over to Irana. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Irina and I'm an international student from Ukraine and I study economics and computer science at Brown University. Um, I have an extensive experience working with youth innovation startups and when I heard about Island 17, I thought it would be a perfect opportunity to contribute to youth development and social impact. Uh, I'm specifically interested in the economic as aspect of Island 17 and in the past two weeks I worked as a part of the funding force to design a token and a tokenized startup fund. Over this time, I have learned a lot about impact investment and startup development, along with acquiring skills such as adaptability, creativity, and creative thinking. Um, next, I will pass down to Queen. His computer died, so we'll come back to him as soon as he gets back on. Okay, I guess I'll take over. Hi, my name is Ritsut Kovai. I'm a freshman at Brown University studying uh, CS and statistics. And I'm from Ethiopia, and that's part of the reason why I chose to work on the survival team. So having witnessed firsthand how like um, things that survival team is trying to address, which are zero hunger, no poverty, clean water, are still existing in a third world country like Ethiopia, I wanted to work on that and hopefully you know contribute to solving them. And what challenged me in the process, and also it was a challenge of the team, sort of the survival team, is that we had to like use a lot of new softwares and new things that we never had like exposure to. And we just had to learn how to learn just from YouTube videos and all these new techniques that we didn't have to use, like because normally we learn in a classroom setting and things like that. So yeah, that was a big challenge. And um, honestly, most of the skills I would say got are from uh, some of the mentors that came in, like Jeff Hoffman, the chairman, he shared some of his insights on how he changed career paths. And that was really impactful for me because um, I kind of learned that I don't need to stick with one thing or like decide right away as a freshman what I want to do in life. And I'll pass it on to Eric. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Eric, and I'm a sophomore concentrating in computer science as well. Uh, I grew up and live in Boston, but my family is from Puerto Rico and Haiti. Um, and I've been working on the survival portion of the game as well. Uh, I chose to work on that portion uh, because hearing about Heidi's vision of youth and the possibility of helping communities through this game excited me a lot. Um, and it was this, this was just in my first meeting with Heidi in the interview, in fact. Um, and so hearing about how it might be possible to help communities out in Haiti and Puerto Rico and other parts of the world really sparked inspiration in me. And games have always been a part of my life as well. Part of the reason I started studying computer science was that I've always been interested in what game development, game development looks like and the behind the scenes of the games that I've played. And surprisingly enough, I got the chance to do just that and more in the last two weeks. It was challenging starting from scratch, but I've learned so much. I'm very grateful for all of it. So just like Ruth, uh, we faced a lot of obstacles in that we were using these programs and softwares for the first time. Uh, so everything you're going to see was built from the ground up. Um, we This was our first time learning it. Um, and it was really exciting, though. I will say it, this is now a skill that it will have for life. And I'm really excited to have that in my arsenal. Um, but we are very grateful for our mentor, Chris, um, who really helped us along the way in teaching us and helping us bring the game that we have to show you today. And so lastly, this sprint was the first time uh, in a long time that I've had a spark of creativity. I've often had trouble with being excited about learning and the classes I've taken, but being able to learn about game development and working under pressure like this has been such a unique experience that I have some newly sparked creativity in me. So thank you, and I'm excited for you all to see what I've, you've accomplished. And I'll pass it off to Quinn. <clears throat> Sorry. Hello, my name is Quinn Coleman. Um, my mission last year with Dream Tank, um, this is my second year, is what inspired me to come back 
to work with the Wintern cohort yet again because I was impressed by the interactive ocean cleanup game that we were able to prototype last year and also only two weeks um, over the summer after the winternship last year. I developed a stronger coding background in C as well as C Sharp, which is the language that Unity, the program that we decided to use, um, is scripted slash coded in. In my cohort last year, we had two very experienced coders. And so I was inspired to sort of come back with my experience and be that for the team this year. Although I wasn't able to work fully with the team this year, I definitely learned a lot such that I've gained not only technical skills, but practical design skills in like during this winter trip. Um, my biggest setbacks, which I will get into more in my slide, um, came from not being able to set a very clear vision while working by myself. Um, I started off a little too ambitious. Um, which I will also get into later, um, but I think it all ended up working out on my end. Um, in my slide later, I'll go into more of like the setbacks and like how I got through them and how they actually were good. Um, I will say that they ended up giving me many skills, such as like hard skills like file conversion, plugins, and also. Yeah, so basically when I jumped into this project, I learned that there are many parts of animation that don't require matrix calculations and lots of creative possibilities that I didn't think were possible. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's sort of a new interest last skill that I gained from the winternship. We welcome you to immerse yourself in our world and drop into a place where we can all dream like a kid. Believe the impossible is possible and make it all happen. Enjoy this meditation.
Okay, so sorry about that. We're gonna send you the links um, for the actual fly through. It's actually on our one of our our main uh, sponsor and champion EXO uh, Open EXO. Um, Nikki, you I think you have the link to that fly through on the YouTube channel. I would be so grateful if you post it so people could have that meditation on their own. So now we have Ruth who is going to bring you further into our story. Okay, thank you, Heidi. Um, so over the past eight years, Dream Tank has been working with youth age eight to 28 using the framework of the SDGs. When imagining how this could be achieved, several young participants suggested that these are not separate, uh, but rather interconnected 17 goals. So Dream Tank uh, challenged them to group them into four groups, which are the groups you see on the slide, survival, living, thriving, and sustaining. And the original Island 17 concept creators named it Island 17 as a massive, massive collective impact problem solving sandbox to focus on bringing people together, breaking down their walls and collaborating to create a thriving world. They adapted these four SDG teams and turned them into the worlds you'll experience in Island 17. The idea is to experiment with them with moonshot goals and ideas within the game based on the different SDGs where a player has fun failing repeatedly as part of the game without real world consequences. When a new solution is discovered, it will receive support to be implemented in the real world and succeed. Um, next slide, please. So uh, as we explained earlier, we all chose survival. So in the survival world, um, I already talked about it, but uh, the reason I chose this is because having witnessed firsthand how uh, the lack of basic necessities could affect your yeah, like your contribution to your community. I, I felt really close with this and res resonated with the cause. So we chose survival and our challenge was to figure out how the game could help people actually survive in the real world by learning skills and being able to access supplies and resources from a global community. And we're going to show you how a fantasy game can create this actual change in the world. Um, so to set the stage of the metaverse game, in the past couple of years, a group of youth and mentors created the overarching uh, story of the overall game. Each world and game within the uh, within will be co-created with youth around the world. And while it's a fantasy made up story, it's based on actual ecological and economic challenges that can happen in the real world and gives you a more positive image of the world we want to create. It also teaches you a good key lessons as a hero journey adventure theme, where the player can learn about themselves, refine their skills, as well as their gifts. And this is a message that a player would get after making it through the labyrinth in level one and is about to embark on their journey through the game. So the story begins. Um, next slide, please. This is a storyboard that basically narrates the whole um, Island 17 story. So not too long ago in a land not too far away, four, four elder leaders found themselves locked in a battle on Island 17. Working together and using their collective abilities, they vanquished their nemesis and went on to live a peaceful and sustainable life. Forming a united alliance, they built a temple and stored their collective essences into an encapsulating orb. To protect the orb, the elders formed a labyrinth that could not be breached without the four collective contributions of the tribes. It has since been the tradition that the elders train a contributor from each tribe to hold the essence of their ability in case the time calls for it. That time is now. The contributors all have their hands on the orb banditry to pull away, but can't. What's going on? I don't know, it's starting to heat up. It's burning me to the core. Uh, the whirling continues faster and faster as the room shakes and rattles, bits of dust and, stall and stones falling down. Then abruptly it stops. There is complete sinus and stillness before, boom. The contributors fly back to the opposite corners of the room as the essence leaves the orb and the orb implodes. And everything fades to black. Yeah, we can okay, hear. Good. But before we watch the video real quick, I would like you to follow along. And if you agree with the universal protocols that are shared in the ending of the video, please comment saying I agree. Um, yeah, we can move on to the video. Our world's energy is being depleted. You have been chosen for your power of imagination and creativity to create a thriving vision for our future. You are not alone. You will receive training throughout your journey to help you succeed. 
But first, you must prove your worthiness and agree to our universal protocol. Repeat after me. I agree to help and not harm, to respect life in all its many forms, to improve myself through knowledge and new skills, to cooperate in the sharing of resources, to use technology for good, and to believe in myself for this mission. If you agree, place your hand on the symbol now. After accepting the mission, the contributors awaken to a dark and dusty interior. The orb is dark and empty, and the essence is gone. There is a slight tremor through the temple, and a light starts to glow above a door that wasn't there before. The contributors stand and work towards it. And Yebek is going to take over from here and explain what the game is. Thank you. Yep, so I'll take you guys throughout the game. Um, so first, when the player opens up the game, they're going to be going through a fly-through, which I'll play right now. Put some audio on the side. Good work on making it past the labyrinth. I can see that you have potential. However, you have not proven yourself yet. Welcome to Survival Island. Here is where your skills will be tested, and you will learn what you need to survive. Since the orb holding our world together has shattered and has pieces scattered across four realms, one being this island, you will need to travel the island and gather essential survival items while learning about their uses, including using our collective intelligence magic book to learn how to create a basic sustainable income in a survival or refugee situation. Only then can you travel to the other realms, living, sustaining and thriving to address the other sustainable development goals and learn how to translate what you learned and together in collaboration with other players, you can innovate with real world impact. You'll also be rewarded with dreams and exos tokens which give you access to mentorship, technology, an accelerator for any ideas you unlock while playing, and design challenge events sponsored by those who wish to solve SDG related challenges. Yeah, so as the audio explained, this is our survival world. The whole objective of the game is to travel the world and essentially collect these survival items um, that'll make up a survival kit. Um, and along the way, we have items that represent one of the, each, each of the- SDGs. Are you wanting to share your screen? Um, yeah, can you not see the game? No, we're just seeing the slide. Okay. It's Elizabeth still sharing. Oh yeah. There so we once, go. Yeah. Perfect. So here so we have. So when we heard the audio, you're gonna the audio would have gone with this guy. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. So this is what the island looks like. Um, we designed and input all of these assets um, to make it very island-like in the survival world. Um, so yeah, each of the items will correspond to an SDG of survival. Um, the first one we're gonna see over here is our book, and when you walk up to an item, you'll see. This, um, this plane of text, which describes the item, um, sustainable ways to approach it, um, and just talking about what you can do with this item. So after the player would read this, they would collect the item um, and it would get added to their survival kit. Um, next, we have the water well, which is over this way, which represents the survival SDG of clean water. Um, so yeah, we put together these assets and scripted the game to make it so that the player could do all of these things and interact with the items. Um, and once they collect four of the items corresponding to the four survival SDGs, they will have completed the game. So here we have our water well um, with more information about it and how to take care of it sustainably and what you can do with these items. Um, and you can collect it once again. Each of the items have a connection in the game so as you saw on that information panel, um, the water would correspond to farming, um, which would, which corresponds to um, zero hunger and that SDG of survival. Next, we have our first aid kit representing good health and well-being. Um, as we're promoting taking care of yourself and you know spreading or keeping medicine that um, can heal you from disease and things of that nature. Again, you can collect the item and it'll disappear, add it to your survival kit. Our last item is at the edge of the island. 
um, representing zero hunger. And here we have some rice plants. So here again, information popping up about the plants. Um, and yeah, we collect it once again. And the game will end. And this audio will play. Congratulations. You have completed the survival mission. You have obtained a survival kit and important knowledge that you can bring back to your family and community. You can either send a survival kit to someone in need or receive one yourself. Also, please accept these dream and exo tokens for your hard work. Good luck on the next mission. So yeah, exactly as the audio said, you completed the game once you have interacted with all the items. Um, and, and you will receive dream and exo tokens at the end of it um, for playing the game, which you can use throughout the metaverse and on different islands to purchase goods and services and work with other people on solving SDGs. So yeah, that's a bit about the game. Um, and this is the prototype of it and you have to flush it out some more. Um, but yeah, that's the basis. And I'll pass it on to Eric to talk a bit more about it. Next slide, please. All right, so now you've seen the demo of what we built, but there are a lot of pieces that weren't shown as we were only given two weeks, right? Um, it's a lot of work to create what we did. And I'm actually very proud of how far we got. Um, but I wanna to talk to you a little bit more about our goals and dreams, and I'll talk about that now. So as you saw, we're gonna use a third person perspective. So there's a character model in the game Right now, we're just using uh, one of the basic Unity assets, but the player will be able to see and customize that uh, model with different outfits. And you'll hear more about that later from Quinn. Um, and so next, the objects that you saw in the demo, the assets that the player can interact with and learn from, which included the first aid kit, the well, the crop, and the book, are only a few of many that we hope will make their way into the game. The objects that are there in the game are available to allow the player to educate themselves on the topic or item, and we hope that in the future, the game will allow players to implement what they learn into their own designs that they can create, leading young minds to become the problem solvers. And along those lines, the book in the future, for example, will serve as a guide to players who want to make that next step. Will they learn new trades like fishing or farming? Will they create DIY solutions in their own communities, create a business, come up with an idea good enough to solve an SDG. Whatever the player may want to do, the guide would help them accomplish it. And lastly, the game includes two graphical versions that makes it accessible for a greater range of computer models. And this is important because people in areas with less reliable internet may not be able to play the high quality version that uh, people with higher end specs would be able to play. So the game will be more accessible to all players. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, as you saw in the demo, there's almost nothing on the island, meaning the player really has to start from scratch and learn how to survive without having the basic necessities to start with. And it's their job to find and collect those things. Now, I want you all to think to yourselves, if you were suddenly living post-catastrophe, would you know how to survive? Now, and don't be shy, if your camera is on, you can raise your hand, but raise your hand if you don't have a survival kit prepared with the items to keep you alive. I personally don't. And it's something that I've been thinking a lot about in these last two weeks. But this is what we're trying to do in the game. We want to teach the player what's important for survival and what they can do with the survival items that they collect. And in the future, like I had said before, the hope is that the game would be able to give an element of creativity to the player where they will be able to come up with meaningful designs and solutions to the SDGs on their own using what they found and learned. So next, the player has to sequentially find the survival kit items, which is what Yebek was doing in the demo, which have a pop-up message on how they could sustainably use it. And as the player progresses, they have a chance of earning tokens and winning the level, which would lead to the living world. And so this living, this real world component is an important one because and I'll give you two points for that. The first is that tokens can be earned and rewarded as a source of income. 
if you're in need and you're playing this game and are able to earn tokens through playing and learning and education, that's an amazing way for people to solve on their own the SDG of no poverty. They'll be able to possibly make their own businesses and create their own ideas and jump into those accelerators that Heidi was talking about. And next, the player has an option of earning a survival kit for themselves or donating it to a refugee family. We're imagining a game where players can use the tokens that they earn to build or earn their own survival kits in real life that they learned about or gathered information on in the game. And providing the option to send a survival kit to someone in need gives a greater incentive to play and earn. And I'll pass it off there. All right, everybody, tell us in the chat if you have a survival kit, what you think so far, how exciting, and just take a moment, give some cheer and uh, kudos so far in the chat. And now we have Quinn Coleman, who was in our program last year, and we also have actually yeah, on the call, Chris Diallo, who was in our program last year. So it's exciting to have you here, Chris. Yay. <laughs> it's so good to see you. Um, so we would love to introduce Quinn. Quinn, uh, it's your turn. Cool. Okay. So, okay. Hello, everyone. Once again, I'm Quinn Coleman, and my role in this sprint was as the developer of early stage game avatars for Island 17. I found that I had quite lofty goals to, to going into this experience, um, as I was one of the winter, winterns last year, and I was amazed at what we were able to get done together. Over the course of the sprint, I had to rework my goals to fit what was realistic while working alone. For example, after most of the first week of the sprint had passed, where I was arduously attempting to build a player avatar from scratch in Blender, I found Vroid Studio, which is an amazingly user-friendly app for building avatars in a way that allowed me to work directly with both the clothing patterns as well as the characters' models themselves. This allowed me to create an androgynous avatar <clears throat> with multiple sizes, as you can see here. Um, sorry. Yeah, multiple sizes as you see here. Um, and this was to place an emphasis on future players to love the skin that they're in regardless of size or gender expression, rather than logging onto another MMO with painfully uniform characters. While this program did seem to be the answer, it did come with its own setback, being that the exported file type was not compatible with Unity, um, where I had created a small world to model these avatars, as well as it just being the platform that we decided to use over Unreal um, to create the survival game. My most successful rework was finding a way to use Blender to convert between file types and eventually be able to drop that avatar from Vroid Studio into Unity with animations using Mixamo. The two designs on the left of the screen will be made, sorry, the two designs on the left of the screen will be made available to players once they have completed each outfit's respective level. For example, the outfit in the middle is meant to symbol symbolize completion of the ocean cleanup game that we prototyped last year, while the one on the left is based on the survival game and also meant to be a part of the prize at the end of that game. The patterns in all of these were created from, sorry, the patterns in all of these were created using a tool called Midjourney, which takes in words and returns for AI generated images that encompass the past in words. I loved using Midjourney to create virtual textiles because I was able to dream big and easily import into and tinker with um, Vroid Studio. And all working with game avatars for the first time was quite interesting in a skill where you think you figured it out only to be met with a new, more complex step moments later. While this was difficult, I learned a lot by throwing myself into Blender um, and this project headfirst. Thank you, Quinn. It's amazing what you came up with and really want to give you kudos for just sticking with it and finding the solutions. Thank you. Um, I'm Elizabeth Harris. Yes, right on. Yeah. 
big head. <laughs> yeah, they're gorgeous. I want some. I want those costumes. <laughs> you know, I, I want to wear them. Um, yeah. So I came to Island Seventeen uh, through Angelique, a fellow water um, water whisperer, I call us, um, and I was very attracted to the idea that we're linking because this has been part of my project that I'm working on for myself called the Watershed Wisdom Council concept of linking our inspiration to tangible, uh, effective field projects to really uh, turn the tipping point that we're facing as a planet to abundant life as opposed to um, chaos and destruction. And so um, just dove right in and have been working with the um, uh, the, in, the winterns, uh, making the objects in Photoshop and bringing them over. And so the the understanding that the the genius of the youth here has just been absolutely phenomenal to watch and see how they the enthusiasm and and recognizing that every revolution and I prefer, prefer to say evolution has come from the youth recognizing that there's issues that need to be solved and their genius of solving them is really the dream here at Island 17 that we're seeking to harness, support, encourage, accelerate, amplify, and, and shoot it off like a rocket. <laughs> and there's so many elements that are coming together just today and, um, and partners that are interested in what we're doing and really weaving together uh, what we're calling a regenerative culture to really create the future for our, our youth. And um, so developing Island 17 further equips the youth with the tangible assets and tools that resonate in the real world. And that will use this game as a way for the young, for the young people, but not exclusively, but really focused on them, but it's not limited to them in any way. So anybody that has, who's young at heart and is of the, um, I, I call us the, uh, the mycelial generation. Has been anybody on the planet that's ready to make a change and commit themselves to it? Um, yeah, really. To, you to want to have uh, Eric state his the dream? Oh yeah, go ahead. I Eric. yeah, the the dream on the slide. Developing Island Seventeen further equips youth with assets that resonate with the real world, and we will use this game as a way for the young people to unleash their creativity for a better tomorrow. And what's your dream, Eric? My dream? My yeah. dream is to get these survival kits going. I would love for these to be tangible and to be able to help people in need. Beautiful. And every single one of these wind turns has a really powerful dream. So we're we're looking how to how to really bring those dreams to to real world. And part of the projects that I've been working on is a, um, a young man who caught my interest and I caught his. I met him first when he was 19 and have uh, stayed in contact with him for over 10 years. And he's working um, on, he's in Guinea, West Africa and has come from a, a poor family, but has vision and has heart and has stick to itness and and uh, the intelligence to to make things happen there's all around the world and it's increasing as climate um you know the, the climate refugees are 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 happening now the social disruption refugees and um this was one of the attractors for choosing these sdgs that the that the group chose now is that many of these young people are from families of refugees or have been refugees themselves. Um, and, you know, this is just Guinea as one example, one city in Guinea is one example and all over the world, this is, these conditions exist where there's a severe water insecurity. Um, in, a, in a country of over 11 million inhabitants, 50% of the population lacks access to safe water. We are so privileged in the Western world to turn the tap and have clean, fresh water come out. 
Um, Guinea is the fourth most undeveloped and unsupported nation, and 75% of the population is under the age of 35, with 50% being under the age of 50. Most of them are without hope, training, employment. They, they have a good education system, but there's no opportunity, as this is a country that is really um, being pillaged. Uh, a third of the world's bauxite, which makes aluminum, comes from Guinea. Gold, diamonds, there's a lot of um, sort of blood resource extraction happening in Guinea, specifically with the forests and the pillaging of the forest, the, the Guinea Highland Forest is keeping pace with the Amazon, but it's mostly unseen because we don't pay attention uh, to what's happening all around the world. Um, and, and the wood that's coming out of the forest is, is getting into our supply chains illegally. Um, and the Guinea forests themselves are in fact the Niger River's headwaters and a vital biodiversity hotspot. Um, so I've been challenging Kareem to find solutions and his solution is creating a kiosk, a community kiosk, which he's calling the water bar, where we now have him working with uh, 30 filters, where he's setting up these bars so he can, these, these buckets and working with a survival unit that was um, donated with Angelique, who's Water, uh, water Unite survivor units. And um, there's more, information that we can send you with regards to these uh, different partners that we're working with. And at the same time, so people can, there's a huge plastic pollution problem in Guinea, the trash, there's no sanitation, there's in a city of, you know, uh, 1.9 million or, or something, there's no sanitation. <laughs> and so garbage is everywhere. And um, so part of the idea is to empower the youth to clean up the garbage um, and earn money through, through this. And they, we can create the gamification of this where they can actually be earning money to pick up garbage or earning rice. Uh, there's programs with, where if they pick up plastic, uh, you know, a bag of plastic garbage, they'll get a bag of rice. Um, and so that's addressing the, no, um, the zero um, poverty and uh, no hunger and also connecting them with this global regenerative culture that's emerging around the world so they can start connecting uh, solutions happening in Costa Rica or in Brazil with the challenges they have here. And, and then um, these kiosks can evolve to become actual local regenerative economy hubs where they'll, they can receive entrepreneurial training and mentorship uh, through the gamification of this game, but also developing it in a wider uh, wider sphere. And um, this is a small video. This is where the water well here. is located. In a very, very dirty environment. This is a kind of drinking water. People come here, they fetch water to drink and see all over the water well is dirty. So as a result, there is a real total need for filters to be sent to this community. Uh, this is Kareem. This community is in need of filters. They are in need of pure water. They are seriously in need of pure water. And this is his water bar. So this is the simplest version. There's also a, a more community-wide version of the survival unit, which serves more people and puts out more out output. And um, these, this is a very simple system. It's very inexpensive. These particular buckets can serve uh, a hundred people for 10 years of properly maintained and they cost uh, $30. So, and this is you know, an example of something that can go in our survival kit and a deal that we hope to, to make. This is a young innovator who came up with this. It's amazing. So these are the women of the community that are singing songs of thanks for the, for the people that care enough about to support them and their children with clean water. And here they're thanking me in particular. We are very happy. No more typhoid, no more diarrhea. Thank you, water So they're saying, uh, there they were saying, uh, thank you very much, Elizabeth in California. Oh, we're very happy. No more typhoid, no more diarrhea. Thank you very much for the water filters. <laughs> 
So this is, this is the real world impact and what it means to these people. Uh, at one point uh, in Guinea, we brought 20 of these water filters and had a training course and it made national news in Guinea. And that's phenomenal that 20 filters that cost under you know, $300 could make national news in a country that needs it desperately. Yeah, beautiful. That's like, I, I see headlines all over the world with youth innovators who've done amazing things in their communities like this. Uh, this is beautiful. Thank you for sharing this. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, hi everyone. So my name is Irina and I've been working on the funding force in the past two weeks. Um, so to achieve the 17 sustainable development goals, we need innovation and intersectional collaboration and youth are proven to be the most creative minds and the best innovators. Yet the youth potential often goes unseen and young innovators lack a centralized support system. The creative innovation process requires many reiterations, trials and errors and financial markets are not set up for that either. Next slide, please. Um, at Island 17, we address those issues by having developed two parts of the metaverse, an earn to play and learn to earn game and Island 17 startup accelerator and dreams tokens. You have already, you already have had, had an opportunity to get a glimpse of the metaverse game. So the next step is the accelerator. The metaverse game serves as an playground for young innovators to experiment, ideate and learn about the real world problems. Is there ideas and vision for achieving one of the 17 sustainable development goals players can apply to the 17 startup idea accelerator? That's one of the ways we promote use ideas and help them make it happen. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so how does Island 17 Accelerator work? The three key aspects of our program are select, accelerate and, su and success. Next slide, please. Um, so this is the roadmap of our Island 17 Accelerator. In the first stage, a trained team of created Island 17 DAO members votes on the best ideas for the Accelerator. The teams then receive microfunding from Island 17 to conduct a two-stage feasibility checks. The teams will receive feedback and mentorship from our DAO members along the way. Then 25 best ideas that pass the feasibility check will be selected to present and presented to the DREAMS token holders. Based on the investment commitment to the token, the inv investors could vote for the 10 best startups to receive funding. The fundamental difference between a regular accelerator and Island 17 accelerator is that people in the DAO and in startups are all invested in each other's success. We, if we accept an idea into an accelerator, we think it's good, too good to fail and we will make sure that the idea will succeed. And the final stage is that startup success reflects in the increase of the dream tokens value. Next slide, please. So in the heart of the accelerator are the tokens and a tokenized startup fund. The problem with many types of investment is that it's hard to combine minimizing risks and maximizing profits uh, while making a real world social impact through a single investment. For example, in uh, things like exchange, exchange traded funds or mutual funds, um, it, it presents a lower risk because it holds a bundle of underlying assets. It has very high liquidity, so it's easy to buy and sell it. It provides a diversification of portfolio, but it, holds, but it also has a lower potential returns and not as much of a social impact. With angel investments, you can invest in early stage startups, but it has a very low liquidity you either lose or win, there is no in between. So it, there is a high risk and there is all eggs in one basket, but there's also a possibility of a higher potential returns. Next slide, please. Sorry. <laughs> um, so we decided to take the best of two worlds and combine it into a token. So uh, the token will hold a bundle of startups the token will have high liquidity. It will be very easy to sell, to buy it or sell it with just having a cryptocurrency wallet. 
it will have a lower risk and it will provide a diversification of portfolio. At the same time, the holders will be able to invest in early stage startups and those startups will be able to provide a much higher potential returns. Next slide, please. Okay, so whether you are excited about our mission as an investor, social entrepreneur, business leader, or um, a youth innovator or a contributor in any other sphere, we invite you on this journey with us. Here are a few ways to engage with Island 17. Yeah, sorry, my video is off, people. Uh, my It's just it broken. It's not working. So uh, join our DAO. Uh, our DAO is everyone here uh, is that's mentored and been a part of it is part of our DAO. And it is, we've been actually using EXO's tokens uh, through a big sponsorship and investment through the EXO Open EXO community to reward people in our DAO to, to work uh, on different things. And um, we would like you to consider joining with your family if you feel like you wanna go on this adventure with us. And we have uh, a form here that you can fill out. Irina? Um, then you can also, everyone can be an investor and purchase, purchase dream tokens. If you're an investor or you're ready to embrace the idea that you are an investor, dreams for the future. Fill in the form to indicate your interest to purchase dream tokens when, you're, when they're ready. We would also like to do a buy one, give one campaign for our survival kits when they are ready. We would love your help funding this effort to enable us to distribute to enable us to distribute these kits quickly and effectively. Please indicate your interest in the form. Sponsor a design challenge. Your company, family, office, or social venture needs a youth innovation to stay relevant in a quickly changing world. We're the source of youth innovation to solve the biggest challenges in the world. And something you can do right now is go listen to the podcast where me and Heidi talk for a little bit and you can hear more about me and the process I had as a winter. Um, so yeah, you can find that link in the chat. Yes, this is a brand new podcast. This Yebek is the very first episode and he announced, uh, he uh, does an, a mini I have a dream speech in the spirit of, of Martin Luther King, which we've dubbed Martin Luther King week. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. I think it should be Martin Luther King year. Yeah, <laughs> Martin Luther King decade. <laughs> <Exactly>. <clears throat> okay, so I know you can't see me, but I really am here. <laughs> okay, so now is um, where we're really inviting uh, the community here to what we were going to do is a breakout rooms, but we really, uh, we, we, we like to have everyone here in the same room and uh, we can ask questions. You can get, find out how you can help. The idea is that since you went through kind of the portal in, into the world and imagine thinking like a kid and that the impossible is, imposs is possible, uh, we would like to invite you in this exercise to uh, assume and imagine that, that these young people are the leaders. They are the leaders and they have the ideas and everyone here is here to support making their dreams come true, right? So in, in traditional feedback of startups, uh, investors like to poke holes in business ideas and see what's not going to work. And, and that's great. We, we all need that. However, in this realm, we are giving feedback in the form of support. Instead of you should do this, it's I'd like to help you do this or I'd like to offer you a resource, right? So help them solve the problems or if you find any gaps. And we also invite in uh, one of our universal protocol that wasn't in the video uh, is to be kind. And whenever we give feedback, um, we don't want a dream crush, right? No dream crushing allowed in dream tank. So imagine asking more questions for them to self-assess versus saying something's not going to work. Um, and usually, and it, when you give feedback, start with glow 
grow, glow. That is our kind of our, our process is we like to start with something positive. Um, sorry, not grow first, glow first. <laughs> uh, uh, and um, because that everyone worked so hard and while there's still a lot to do, we really wanna keep high vibes and also problem solve and, and get to a real solution that we can move forward on. Um, so we have uh, some advisors in the room through the EXO community, and we have our mentors and we have our team members. Uh, I am just trying to figure out how to remove the spotlights. Sorry, give me a second. So everybody's here and we would love to hear from anyone who has um, comments, glow, grow, glow, and or an offer. And we will start with uh, answering questions around the game itself and focus all together on the survival and that group. And then we will focus on anyone that wants to give comments on Quinn's project, because we basically had three projects. And then we'll focus on the token in Irena's all together. So we're basically swarming and saying, how can we help you? And what challenges um, do you want us to help you overcome? Okay, it's very weird with the, you not being able to see me, but uh... <laughs> I'd, li I'd like to get a little feedback from Fabrizio first, because he saw these young people just two days ago and just get his feedback as to how far they've come and what you saw, what did they take notes on and what surprised you, et cetera. Excellent, thank you. Thank you, Nithya. Thank you again, Heidi, for the invitation. So uh, as I said two days ago, I mean, I'm more and more impressed by the speed of the, the evolution of what I see. I mean, I know how hard is work community because they decided to start in front zero that it's really impressive in terms of small bank I mean, I'm really, really impressed by the quality, how smooth is the animation and uh, how uh, much, let's say, technicality you take care of. Probably if you're not familiar with game, you can't see, but there's a lot of details like, for example, there's no overlapping of polygons, there's the, the 3D movement are very, um, how can I say, very smooth interaction is pretty good as well. So. You did a great job uh, and that's that's really impressive. And also connecting what to, uh, to the presentation, I really like the step. It's a pity the video was a bit lagging, but a lesson learned. Next time we will put the video up or distribute the video maybe. I will be super happy to go through the video again. And um, I mean, I see the idea growing. I think that that time the presentation was way better so congratulations and the whole idea also it takes form because the more i take in notes and i will send you the notes later it's like 58 lines paragraph sorry uh i kind of see how you are imagining your island as a community DAO, and as you can even uh, use that as a perfect training field for the the community slash DAO you will like to improve that that's pretty good uh, what I can say in terms of, let's say, suggestions we already discussed, um, I think you created the basis now, and now you have to move to stop thinking about technicalities. I know there's a lot of work, but start thinking about interaction. There's a lot of um, online words, I'm sure you know that. You talk about a metaverse, you talk about an online community, start thinking about evolution. You presented four classes in your video, I'm very curious to understand how the classes will evolve, or if you would like to use a game reference like uh, Warhammer 40,000, how the profession will evolve and the skill they take and how they share the skill with other people, how they can create collective abilities, collective knowledge, slash obviously the intelligence you mentioned before. Um, yeah, and maybe later we can go back and take a look at the advancement uh, you mentioned the prices, there's a lot of, obviously, possibility there. But 
again, congratulations. I think you put the, you designed it, the perfect environment to host now the community. So now it's time to evolve and let people evolve following your dreams. Thank you, Fabrizio. I appreciate that. Thank you. And yeah. when turns, you can come off uh, mute if you would all like to, just because this is a discussion and that would be great. And if you want to thank you, Fabrizio. Yeah. And my question is really, how do you see the interaction? How do you see the evolution? Because I heard a lot of things in the video and in your presentation. I heard about the collective intelligence. I'm very curious to see how are you planning to put that in place and maybe connect to the uh, accelerator you mentioned. Because for me now, as I say, you have a perfect field to host people, let them collaborate, generate ideas and bring the ideas to the real world. So what's your plan? Yeah, I appreciate the feedback. Um, as you said, Unity, it was tough to work with and learn in the beginning, um, but we got our hands on it and figured it out. Um, to the product that we had today. Um, but yeah, we we hope that, um, you know, this was just the prototype of the game. And we hope that it gets further, further like developed. Um, and we want to connect it to real world situations and actually have these survival kits available to the player. And, you know, uh, encourage people to play the game to survive, to receive a survival kit or even just donate one to those in need. Um, so, yeah. So oh, I, I would like to say interrupt or close, but what, uh, the, the main question now is, because I didn't have the time to read the description uh, in your demo, but what is inside a survival kit? How do you, how will you explain people how to use it and how to use the tools inside to, again, develop something, crafting, building? At the end of the game, survival game needs crafting and building, again, you know that. So what's inside and how people will use it? I heard from, sorry, I heard from Elizabeth or maybe Heidi that, uh, for example, the filter will be inside, but what else? I'm very curious now. I mean, I can speak to that a little bit. I think it will depend on who the player is and where they are. Um, I think our, our goal or our vision is that a survival kit won't be every single item that's in the game. It will be a collection of items that you can choose and pick pick and choose from that you've collected and learned um, throughout your playthrough um, and kind of pick the best ones for your situation um, based on the information that it gives you. And part of that information also includes links and um, like internet sources where you can, for example, find a spring, findaspring.com um, lets you find clean water near you. Uh, which I didn't know until these um, these last two weeks. But having that in the game and like just having that information and having the player choose uh, what exactly they need or want. Uh, am I allowed to say something? Absolutely. Uh, fantastic. Um, I just want to say congratulations uh guys and girls it was really amazing um presentation and very clear explained everything uh, really well um this is the first time i'm really seeing it i read about a bit about it before i came here and before i was invited and it's really inspiring uh, to see such young people do these things in such a short amount of time um i work for a, a web3 incubator accelerator um, so I see a lot of different types of projects, especially a lot of gaming projects, a lot of metaverse projects, hundreds, in fact, um, pitches and pitch decks and ideas and, and things like that. And this is a really, really good. A lot of the projects that I see that people have been developing for so long don't even have an MVP ready. So seeing this um, really brings it all together. So I'm, I'm really impressed with that. Um, what really resonates this project for me is its applicability to the real to the real world so a lot of times i see a lot of projects with nfts with gaming metaverse but there's no real connection to the physical world so when i see that 
when the physical meets the digital that really kind of resonates to me and i think the social impact of it as well is is really good is really good i've worked with a few projects and i'm still working with some some projects that um have something similar they have metaverse and they have real world impact I was working recently we incubated a project um based in kampala in uganda so it's basically utilizing blockchain technology to help people in the villages open their own uh, restaurants in their own homes and then they use a, a digital token um, to exchange money in that way because um, they don't have banks and things like that there's a lot of unbanked people in that part of of east africa so i'm kind of aware of the impact and i've actually seen like photos and videos of people actually opening their kitchens because of the use of the technology which is really which is really good so i i like that i i like the concept that you guys are working with um there's a lot of a lot of people speak about the metaverse um but, but they're not really, we're not really i don't think anyone's really sure what the metaverse will end up being um will it be you know inclusive of nfts will there be marketplaces in there i think the key thing for you guys is to think of what strategic partnerships will you make in order to um, propel your idea to the next level? Um, I think a lot of people have good ideas, but you need to think of it as like a business. Um, I mean, I deal with um, the, Afri the African blockchain center, which helps um, projects, Web3 projects and Metaverse projects in Africa. Um, there's also, I like the idea of you donating something to the physical um, the world. The, the problem with, with I, which I've seen in, in donating things is that people are often scared of if I put my money or if I send something to someone, is it really getting to them, to that real, to that person? And then some, some aspects of blockchain technology actually solve that problem. I'm working with a project that actually um, uh, is helping farmers in Nigeria um from from the farm all the way to the table and you can track that um you can track the journey of that using the blockchain technology through qr codes so that's something that you should probably think about when uh, looking at the donation aspect of your game can that person who's donating see who the actual person is going to and that really like hits home if you can see the person that you've donated a bag of rice to for example um I think that will, that's really impactful. Um, so there's some things there. Obviously, I think you can maybe implement uh, um, land sales. You know, land sales are very big as well in the digital world. You could probably kind of sell some land or uh, and and um, fractionalize it as an NFTs and sell those. People can stake those NFTs on the platform. There's a lot of things you could do to generate revenue. Uh, I think the 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 whole idea is great but you also have to think what's the token economy how does how 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 sustainable is it is the business actually going to, how are you going to drive people to use the platform as well there's user acquisition um how do you bring on uh non crypto natives into into your metaverse people that are not familiar with that how do you educate them there's a lot of things to think about but i think you've got um a really good basis of an idea and i think the future is really bright in this project and I'm really impressed with it. Amazing. Thank you. I want to just address one thing. You, uh, this is amazing, incredible feedback. Uh, and um, one thing I want to uh, share that I don't think we, I, I know we didn't put in here, <laughs> is that we actually were offered through, um, through a global entrepreneurial um program called the Global Entrepreneurship Network, which is in a, a, every country, pretty much, uh, almost every single country in the world has a, has a community in every single country. Um, they've offered us distribution as soon as we have the first, uh, the first beta. So how is that's going to get introduced through entrepreneurial and innovation communities in every country, which will uh, engage local youth as well as uh, to uh, test and play, and they're going to iterate from there. And it's going to be youth actually creating aspects of this game as it grows, and it will ultimately become open source, where uh, it will stay fresh and exciting, because youth are going to constantly be using it, innovative, innovating, and as well as with the the dreams token and the fact that everyone is invested in each other's success, is going to make it really sticky. 
so those are a couple of points I wanted to share about uh, that we, the, the missing piece is actually building this thing that we can get out there, something first level that we can put out there um, and, and uh, raising the funds for that and getting a global community together to finish that. And we're planning to develop each segment of this in a three month accelerator where young people can come and help us build different aspects of the game. So they're going to make sure it's fun because they're going to be playing it for themselves and making it for themselves. So that's why we didn't say, here's the exact roadmap of how to build this. We said, what do you think? How would you guys build it? What do you want to do? Um, so it's a, just wanted to add those points. Justin, I see you jumping out of your uh, seat to say something. <laughs> Justin was our one of our mentors at, here in Boulder uh, for one of our programs. Uh, so so good to see you here, Justin. Yeah, this is a it's a beautiful demo day. Uh, so congratulations to the team, and I can just feel all the hard work and all the heart, but also all the potential and possibility that kind of lives. In each person, but also in the collective kind of vision and your ability to coordinate with each other um, and make something really tangible and to prototype something meaningful um, that not only kind of speaks to the possibility, but also shows like a, yeah, the physical or the embodiment of the potential. Um, I think taking heart and putting into tech is not easy, but the heart is really kind of clear in that. And that's, that's really beautiful. Um, yeah, I guess what I want to kind of, if I, if I, my, my jumping on my seat is, yeah, it's kind of excitement. Um, it's great to see like a young, like a kind of a multicultural, a really kind of solid Brown team uh, uh, doing, doing not Brown University, but also I think, um, you know, Brown and <laughs> brown and skin and in tone, uh, kind of being able to kind of show up in the way that you are. Um, and not because it's like a disadvantage, but because of the nature of that's not something that you often get to, to see in the world of, of Dow um, or in the world of uh, virtual reality. Um, it's not it's it's just it's you're saying like you know we're using the word youth a lot but you guys are you guys are operating at a level that's that's quite mature and an adult and so you're doing a lot of things that are at the edges of edges and it's really beautiful to, to see that too um so that's kind of my my i forgot what the the layers were but that's like my that's all the things that are there's some good things and some hard stuff and maybe some more like technical perspective is um I'll drop a link in the chat, but I kind of shared that first project with you. Um, but I think also I could share seeds. So I worked with seeds and in seeds um, for the last two years, and we were a regenerative cryptocurrency uh, that focused on connecting global social governance across the world with hyper local projects. Um, and so we were a funding resource that were like, instead of kind of being on the normal exchanges of the crypto market, we, uh, we stayed off exchanges in order to keep the rate and the price of the cryptocurrency low enough to actually be able to be affordable um, to any type of nation and any type of project across the world. Um, and so it was a way for us to not only uh, support local land-based projects of all types um, through campaign structures, um, but also be able to uh, help them, us help the world learn how to coordinate as a global society in order to actually get things done. And in so many ways we failed. <laughs> and in so many ways we were successful. And I just share that with you because the things, a lot of the challenges, I think that um, Fabrizio and, and Nathan brought up a lot of really big challenges. Like how do you actually help to coordinate and educate the learning that allows for skills and capacities to be coded into a character? <laughs> or, or how do you take the, this kind of complex distribution, uh, DAO, community creation, uh, a biz, vi created viable business model that not only sustains you, but also is constantly listening, iterating with the people that you're looking to serve. That's not easy, um, but you're not alone in that. Is really what I kind of want to bring with that. There's a lot of organizations out there that are really aligned and who are working in the same way with in these ways right now, they may not be obvious. And so something that I can uh, you know, support and offer if it's helpful is, is pointing you in the direction of organizations that may be able to support or inspire or take what may seem abstract and far away and make it really grounded um, and, and help to kind of analyze maybe what, what what's working, what's not working, what they do. Um, and so that's kind of my, I, I could probably offer more things, but I think that's really kind of grounded here is kind of saying, hey, like, you know, great job. And it's really beautiful and inspiring who you are and how you're doing what you're doing. And the fact that you did it in this way, 
um, that the things that you have as challenges ahead of you are things that are challenging to all. And there are people that are working to solve those unique aspects and you can work with them, learn from them and continue to build and grow what you have here in a meaningful way. And if I can support you in understanding those models, understanding the right kind of resources or interconnecting you with those networks or those ecosystems, I'm happy to do that um, because I, um, yeah, I believe in you guys. And I think, it's, I think it's, I think just, you know, two weeks, like what are you gonna do with a year if you choose to keep going, right? Um, what, what would you do with another month? Um, I'd love to see that. Yeah, thanks. Beautiful feedback. Thank you, Justin. Anybody else? No students want to Eric jump in? Eric Patel, I'm going to call on you. Okay. <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. How's everyone doing? Nice to see Heidi awesome. and uh, Nikki and others and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing how these projects grow, right? So first off, again, hats off to everybody. Um, two weeks sounds like a lot of time, and I think you all know that it really isn't. Right. So whether you do, um, I'm sure you guys have probably heard of this, right? The Pomodoro technique, right? And um, I always get it wrong, but I think it's called, I always want to say the Pareto principle, but it's actually Parkinson's law, right? Like work fits at whatever time that you have. So you guys had two weeks, you did what you could in two weeks, right? Just amazing. So hats off to you for that. Um, clearly anything within the STGs is, is time worth spending, right? Um, as a scout within kind of the, the Boy Scout world, um, I'm definitely into emergency preparedness, right? I've made that little comment in the chat there. And so I've got all my gear, I have the training, the skills, everything, right? So this is definitely a little bit close to my heart. So I will be supporting you guys in the future for sure. Uh, really like the, again, the idea behind uh, personal development, right? The tools. And I think that the other thing that was mentioned was um, mindfulness, right? Mindset, your thinking, because again, as you all know, right? You could have the tools, but if you don't know what to do, you may be in trouble, right? And clearly this is an area worth uh, investing in. Love the Web3 tie-in, right? With the Dreams token, uh, a lot of us are um, playing in this space a lot. And uh, we're really excited to kind of hear and see uh, what's gonna be happening in the years to come. And I love the call to action at the end too as well, right? So for those interested in the DAO or the token pre-purchase, the survival kit, the buy one, give one, love that, right? And I think that's a great idea. And also just the uh, design challenge, right? And I think you guys mentioned. So really just great to see this um, and want to wish you guys well and uh, looking forward to hearing more about how things go. Beautiful. Thanks, Eric. Thank you, Eric. That's amazing. I know the wind turns were writing the down, taking notes with everybody uh, that's offering amazing gifts uh, and knowing that you're a survival enthusiast preparedness is uh, awesome. And we're so happy to have you uh, help us figure that out. So, Students, uh, any feedback or questions of Eric or any of the other advisors? We've got one more to go. Keep going. Um, I'm going to jump in here quick um, in terms of a real solid next step. Um, I've been also involved in a, a experiment with Earth Day uh, Climate Education Coalition, which was um, launched at COP27 and a platform called B to uh, have the first ever um, regenerative shindig inside of the multiverse. I put the invitation there and, and we're talking about and, and we're uh, looking to partner with them and, and hopefully can be there as well um, in, as representing Island 17. And we'd love everybody to come in and, and um, just play around with us and offer feedback uh, in terms of, you know, really looking forward to how we can craft the ethos of of the metaverse of Web3 and and connect it to Earth, so that it doesn't just dis you know keep keep going out and out and out and out into the ethers, but we can really ground it to Earth. Um, so to me, that's a really solid next step is is um, you know beginning to really get active there and and bring um, resiliency regeneration caring for our planet, caring for each other into the metaverse and make it tangible, practical, and functional. 
Excellent. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And uh, grounding is good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so everybody's we're invited. It's an open, it's an open party. So bring your friends. <laughs> Well, everyone, join our DAO, get on our Discord, come play with us. <laughs> I'd like um, to add one more note, if I could, Heidi, if you don't mind. I just wanted to share with everyone here um, the openness that the students have had and like just to what's possible out there. I mean, obviously, as we're saying, but in particular toward the uh, feminine um, as I mentioned in the chat, like that has been something that's been on the radar and is really important in terms of balancing our systems is really acknowledging that that energy that has, you know, the voice has really been separated from the narrative. So I just want to applaud um, all the winterns in, in seeing that and opening the door for that and just being able to receive uh, the option to have that balance within our ourselves and bring that to the world because it's it's critical right now to bring back that voice. So thank you for being willing to hold that space. I just wanted to give my personal regards to that. It means a lot to me and I believe to our future. So thank you. Thank I you. second what Anjali says. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes, Ladies, these are all of our, Angelique was very everything. active in our program, Lisa, they're all our DAO members, and um, Angelique has been bringing Indigenous wisdom into this, so there's a lot of elements that, you know, we, we don't have time to touch on everything, but um, it's woven in, um, is really a deep reverence to our roots, and to a lot of wisdom, where people have been thriving, humans have succeeded in thriving in history and we can do it again better than ever before uh also before we move on uh, well now i'm going to highlight uh quinn and also bring chris diallo on and see if chris you have some words uh for your uh the brown students about your experience of what of witnessing where we're at um, Heidi, before that, the, um, Justin asked a very important question that I'd just like to really quickly touch on. And he basically said, do you have intention for another sprint? And, and the answer is yes, absolutely, without a doubt. And we will have as many design challenge sprints as we can find sponsorship for. So help us help us with that, right? We, we we really are at the point where we'll keep doing this regard, regardless, but we really- oh, should, should, I'm getting I, I, tired. I'm speaking, for myself, <laughs> speaking for myself, speaking for myself, speaking for myself, I'm not stop. giving up on this Yeah. because we are the youth's future, right? They're not our future, we're their future. And 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 we need- We can support we their the future. funding to help us do what we're doing. So, um, you know, Contact us for, for if you know of someone that can help us sponsor a design sprint. We will we will shine the spotlight on what their work and what they're doing. And you know it, it it's it's all hands on deck, but we have to build the decks. Right? <laughs> we have to build the decks to stand on. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for addressing that, Elizabeth. Yeah. Um, so Chris, I don't know if you're still there. I don't, if you're, if you don't want to come off camera on camera, that's okay. I just want to acknowledge you, um, and that you are now you've graduated and I'm excited to connect with you more about what's going on in your life. Um, and I'm happy to see you here. So next we have, we're going to put the spotlight on Quinn and the costume design. And I want to bring up, um, that, uh, the, there was an interesting, a really unique thought process Quinn went through to create this. And that includes like body awareness and loving yourself and loving your, your own skin, um, not changing who you are, but maybe enhancing who you really are inside. And he also met a lot of challenges throughout the way, uh, throughout the time and overcame them with grace. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, bring Quinn um, off of the audio off of uh, mute and just say if anyone wanted to talk about the characters. Um, we barely got started on this. This would ideally be an entire accelerator, like, right? So if we got sponsorship from someone who wanted to 
both sponsor sustainable fashion and um, be a part of the game, um, that could be something, right, that Quinn could lead. So Quinn, um, please go ahead and ask the kind of what kind of feedback or, or help would you like to have if you were to keep moving forward with this project? Um, I guess, I guess if I was to continue moving forward, um, like I would just need probably mostly help on, I guess, making sure that um, the the service that I used to create the avatars, like that, like the avatars created with that service, like that I'm not wasting my time creating things that won't be able to be in the game because of like copyright issues. Um, so that, and then also the other sort of, I guess, difficult point was um, animating the avatars. Uh, I was able to animate them. Um, it obviously wasn't in the survival game, but I have them in a uni Unity world where they're all animated. Well, they're not fully animated, but they are able to walk and they have a standing animation and a running animation. And so, like I said, the process of animating um, <clears throat> game characters and avatars is like super difficult, a lot more difficult than you might think. So I think that would be like where I need the most support. Amazing. So I just wanna acknowledge that um, Michael Freebay didn't get a chance to comment on the first part, uh, but I wanna also uh, first have people respond to Quinn's uh, piece. Um, and then, um, Professor, please feel free to speak on one or the other or both. I don't mind stepping in here. So I don't claim to be any expert on avatars or creating these, but I do work with a lot of companies that um, have created avatars on different um, on different platforms like Unity and, and things like that. So I can definitely go out and ask them. You know, I speak to a lot of these guys all the time. Um, I speak to, there's a really good company we're working with called Metamazonia, who are helping the people in the Amazonia by, in the Amazon rainforest by um, making a real world 3D uh, metaverse of the actual rainforest. Really good, really cool project. Go check it out, metamazonia.io, uh, I believe it is. They use like really good um, triple A graphics and avatars and things like that so i'll be able to i'll be able to ask the founder leo um definitely for you and i have a lot of um digital skins and things like that a company called metaware i think so i can ask them all these technical questions so if you have any technical questions fire them over to me i can ask them and get you the answer even though i don't know myself thanks thank you Amazing. Thank you. That that looks amazing. Matt Tamazomi, no, ah, I can't say it very well, but I uh, saw the SDGs there right away. And uh, that's exciting to explore. Anyone else on Avatar's costume design? All right. So Michael Freebay. I have a question for Quinn. Oh, I guess around. Okay. I'm oh, sorry. Just around. Yeah, just around. So when I think about the nature of the kind of the way you think about community DAO. And I think about the challenge you're facing when it comes to actually um, building out what you need in Unity. Uh, I wonder if you're, you know, how are you thinking about using this kind of collaborative spirit? Or are there ways you can use the collaborative spirit to find or pull the talent and skills you need to be able to kind of continue to build what's going, what's ahead of you? Right now it feels like you're having to carry a lot of weight on your own. Not on your own, like, you know, as a team, but like you're really having to carry a lot of the design and, and a lot of that kind of development weight. And I wondered how you can kind of use the energy of, of I-17 Dream Tank to, to find the support that you need as you kind of continue to hold the vision and, and, and lead that way. Yeah, and so, yeah, for sure. So that's sort of, so the way I was, I was sort of trying to talk about it when I was, when I was talking the first time was like, that there's separate parts of like creating the avatars and like getting them in the game that can be like separated out and like it can be sort of an assembly line so there is designing the avatars there is um coding the animation which is really hard 
and then there's also like how do you access these avatars in the game so there's like a design portion a somewhat design somewhat coding portion then there's like pure coding and so if that was to be like given to three different groups it would there would be just like a really good final product because those three things like nothing is not being taken care of and so i guess that's sort of how i would see um collaboration being best used best. All right, I'm jumping right. in now, so otherwise I uh, I probably will not speak, but that's all right. So I was no, uh, I was I just was gonna little... prompt you. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. So I was a little I was a little scared because I got yelled at already because I I started to say something I don't agree yet, and uh, and uh, that that I I simply did not know that I was only supposed to say something positive. I was uh, no, I was kind of like jumping in oh. because I was yeah I was kind of like jumping in because uh, people always commented. I said okay fine I'll say something too no but in, in all honesty <laughs> I think it's really really it's really really nice the uh, the uh, visuals you did and the game you did. I do however come from a different perspective and and I wanted to just basically give you that perspective from a fifty eight year old white hair uh, almost white haired not yet male person coming from Europe who actually does have some money and could be a sponsor, right? Or just see me as that. And attracts people like me and has actually a value to people like me and actually is an excitement to people like me. I understand that the gaming is something to address the the young people. I I am a very digital person. I think Nikki can confirm that. I I am I'm very good at all these kind of things. I have never in my life played a game though on computer except the first one now with Fabrizio and Nikki where we designed a game. Now I checked a little bit your your actually mandate. The mandate says learn and earn, play to learn, and collective impact. So I just uh, you know read that off your, your 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 page. So the first part I think is the most important thing: learn. And I I just think that you know the learning gets a little short with when you do too much focus on the gaming. And uh, I also believe that the sponsor stuff and and the, the, the and getting people attracted is actually something that where you need to show a certain amount of impact, that's mandate number three. So um, I, I, I do believe that you need to get to a, to a point where people see what's actually going on and what the impact could be on this one. So that needs to fit into a large vision and needs to fit into something that people can actually look at and say, I, see, I get the point here. I know that the young people are important. I get the point of the, uh, of the important aspects of gaming. I get the point of the survival kits. I do understand the accelerator. I think the accelerator is actually a really cool idea, but the accelerator still means you need to get a value proposition into the accelerator, right? So all in all, I, 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 I know that sounds really bad and, and I don't want to be too negative on that, but you need to find the pathway to, the, to money and to profit and to, and to some aspects of actually a sponsor reasoning so why would you sponsor so you need to actually be in that respect a little bit more realistic probably and maybe a little bit more direct and if you are that direct then you actually get the money i'm pretty sure about this but i i was a little confused and then i'll stop because i, I don't want to take over here i i i was a little confused of all the many different ideas you have they are all good but they need to be tied together and they need to make you know, to the outside world, see me as the outside world, they need to make sense to the outside world. And if that's the case, I think you have a really, really great value proposition overall. So I, again, I'm, I'm just missing some things where, 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 where you tie the little puzzle pieces together. But all in all, I think it would be a really, really cool thing if that would make sense. I don't know if that's understandable what I said. Very understandable. Awesome. Thanks, Michael. Um, I, 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 would, I would um, like to address that really quickly. Um, I see that what we're doing is weaving many different threads and you come into a weaver shop and you see thread all over the place, <laughs> but we are really weaving things together and it, and we can feel them coming together. And while there seems to be a lot of loose threads 
there's a lot of thought that's gone, you know, is behind how we're weaving things together. Yeah, and, and the Kareem example, we we actually added that because uh, Fabrizio gave us some great feedback um, that we had to tie the real world impact and give a more of an example of that. And that's what we attempted to do. And now it's on us if it wasn't still stressed enough. But Kareem is only one of the examples of when, um, and there's a lot of research that shows that when you play a, a game and you want to achieve a goal in the game, uh, you learn what you need to accomplish the game faster than if you would in um, traditional methods of education and learning. And that's what we've seen happen over and over again is that the learning is exponential. And, and in fact, students don't even know they're learning because they're having so much fun. And the way they think learning is supposed to be is sitting in a classroom, falling asleep, which is what a lot of young people experience in traditional school. Um, so in this case, they're engaged, they're playing, they don't even know they're learning. And I've seen 10 year olds learn uh, advanced math that seniors in high school or college students would do just to accomplish a goal in a game to solve a problem. And we also have some, uh, some examples of sponsored design challenges where we provided innovation to paying sponsors from youth. So we did rapid prototyping sessions, um, design challenges where, uh, you know, how can we address PTSD in veterans um, with a game? Um, and that was actually tested and researched by a psychologist who said they couldn't believe how young people designed exposure therapy into a game for PTSD treatment without ever knowing what it was intuitively. Um, so there's a lot of wisdom in, in, in kind of the, the nascent um, innocence of young people that we're seeing come out to yield um, big real world impact. We have three laws actually that were changed in the state of Colorado through youth social entrepreneurial uh, adventures. And then um, we also have some proofs of concept from our hackathons. So thank you though. It, it, and what we would love to talk to you about, Michael, is what goal you wanna solve, right? What do you wanna solve? What do you wanna do? And we customize a design challenge for you right, to get for you to access youth innovation to apply to your prop uh, projects. Uh, let me uh, let me just uh, quickly comment on this. I, I don't disagree at all that young people are incredibly um, innovative. They have completely different ideas that we have not thought of for, for a lot of things. But my comments were mainly based on Island 17 as a whole package. Let me use it as a package, right? And that you have like little components that are successful and will, will create something, I, I have no doubt on this one. But what you wanted to do is you want to create a, a, an Island 17, 17 value proposition for sponsors, right? Not for individual little things, but for a whole, for the, for the entire package. For I would like to create something with Island 17, which creates a huge impact and solves SDG problems. And by doing da, 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 da. And what you're doing right now, and I, I, I think that's what Elizabeth said with, with, the, with weaving and having these little pieces, you may have them all. See me as somebody who does not understand the weaving yet, you know, and who, who understands some of the little pieces, but does not necessarily see how that fits into the big weaving pattern. So the, the, the pattern needs to be clear. And then you fill it up with the with the with the with the pieces, and and I'm just having a little bit of a trouble with the with the with the pattern and with the with the overall uh, um, with the overall value proposition, the overall presentation, and I think this is something you need to fine tune, and this is something you need to have to present to the outside world because this is actually what's the real value of what you do, and that could be huge if you present it the right way. So again, my criticism is not so much on on like that you're doing something wrong, but that it's maybe difficult for people like me to grasp it, right? And, and, and maybe there's a little bit of an age problem. Maybe there's a little bit of a technology problem. Maybe there's a little bit of a problem that I, I, I do believe in the real world to a lot of extent, not so much in the virtual world. 
and and we need to find a connection between the real world and the virtual world. I think these packages that you were proposing, those are the connection to the real world. Those would be a really good thing, but you need to have something where there is an interaction between the real and the virtual world and the learning. And I think when you pro if you communicate this well, it will be a huge. It will have a huge impact. Thank you. That's fantastic feedback, really. Uh, and and it is. It's going to get tighter and tighter with incredible feedback like this that help us refine our message. Um, and we're excited to have you on the journey with us to um, to really you know keep pushing us uh, to tighten it up. Um, that's really really grateful. Uh, and so now we are going to focus on the um, the project that Irina and Stephen Howell worked on. Um, and we would like to spotlight them. And so they pretty much, uh, Stephen is a, a youth innovator and entrepreneur himself and joined our DAO in our funding force pod. We're organized into five operational pods and four SDG, you know, tribe pods, survival, living, thriving. The other pods are, uh, so when you join our DAO, you can join Operations Ninjas. You can join Education Imagineers, who are people who uh, work on the program and making sure we get all the best, uh, best practices of all the different types of curriculum we could weave in. We have um, Imagination and Design, which is tech, hardware, and software. So uh, then we have media stars, so people who can help us spread the message, help us with social media, do help us with the podcast. Uh, and then we have funding force. So that's everything to do with funding, blockchain, uh, you know, tokens, NFTs, uh, equity offerings, everything there. And uh, Brandon and I are a member and Nikki are member and Lisa and Steven are all members of that pod. And Irina joined our pod for the two weeks and advanced forward uh, this work that Steven started with, what if we could create a dreams token? So, uh, so let's open the, open the floor for Steven and Irina. What would you two like to see? You know, make uh, just say hello and ask sure, for just saying hey, what's up, oh. everyone? Uh, happy to see the progress through these through these two weeks. Uh, pretty exciting stuff. Um, just some really cool work with like seeds and the village uh, that you're living at right now. It looks like you're in like a little hut. Super nice. <laughs> Good vibes. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Um. Michael, I think you had like pretty precise feedback. Um, pretty awesome to, to hear that that view. And I think, you know, that it's exactly what we're trying to do is, is reach people like yourself with capital that wants to invest, you know, in ideas that change the world. So uh, super aligned with you there. Uh, Winterns, awesome job. Like Fabrizio was saying, you know, starting from zero, zero to 100 in two weeks. It's <laughs> awesome. Amazing job. And uh, you know, I think we have our work cut out ahead of us to like really create create a better res response where it, it it can be more you know concise to the point, uh, and and portray the story that we're all feeling inside of our hearts right now, which is every single one of us wants to go out and help change the world. Um, you know, I totally see that, and we just have to you know make that message clear and really broadcast that. So uh, yeah, just jumping in saying hi. It was awesome working with you as well, Arena. She's super smart. Uh, she came in with like like a ton of a ton of great questions, uh, stumped myself, stumped mentors. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and just made us think about different ways to like look at this this idea. Um, so I want to say thank you to Arena as well. Thank you, sir, and thank you for the great feedback. Um, yeah, it was really a pleasure working on this whole thing. And I really learned a lot throughout this uh, internship. I learned a lot about investment and also teamwork. And just the way I see this 
accelerator in this game. I, I see it as uh, Island 17 has two target audiences, just my opinion. Um, one is investors and one is players, people who want to uh, start their startup or just play a game. And I think that we also have a big value proposition for investors because it's a way for them to increase the value of their investments. And um, it's like a new financial product to invest in this startup fund and have their value of the tokens increase. And yeah, and if you have any feedback, that would be great. I, sorry to say, to jump in there very quickly, this one, I, I disagree with you again here. So I'm sorry to say that. I think everybody is, to, is inter should be interested in that. It's not only, and, and everybody should be a customer. The customer is not, if you address SDGs, everybody is concerned about SDGs. And I, 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 I really tell you, it's a lot easier to get a thousand people give you 50 bucks and one person give you 50,000. So at the end of the day, I think you should try to address you should try to address um, everyone and everyone with the focus on, on SDG and, and solution provision. I, I, I think this is a really good thing you're doing, but don't, don't segment it too, too small. The, the players are one thing, the players, maybe they do it just because they play, not because they wanna do the SDG, but there's a lot of people who would like to get into the gaming if they know they can help something. And, I, I think that would be you you are losing out on a lot of things if you just focus on these two in these two uh, customer segments. So how Makes long sense. would it, it, it take for us to get a million players to pay us one dollar? <laughs> You're part of this EXO. Maybe maybe Nikki should talk a little bit about EXO, right? And 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 Eric is on there too. You have a you have a crowding community and you have engagement uh, that you create. And at the end of the day, people when they like a game, they say, "I'm just picking a couple of names here." Lisa says, "This is a really cool game. You bet, you, you, you should you should play that too." What kind of marketing do you need? This is the best thing you can do. So what you need to do is you need to excite the people, and the the people itself uh, themselves will actually make sure that it's marketed and they make sure that people will get to it. And if you say, Lisa, I'm putting in you, putting you in the spotlight again, if you say this is a really cool game, it actually solves the problem, it actually is good for everyone, you should play that too. And it's only like 10 bucks. I mean, why would you not do that? You don't need to do any marketing, it's the best thing you can do. I'm not going to say anything anymore now. I'm done. <laughs> no, you're probably right. not. No, Michael, <laughs> keep saying it. Everything you're saying is so true and so valuable. So thank you. I really, I mean, I can only speak for my opinion, but yeah. I think everything you're saying is great. Uh, say more. <laughs> <laughs> can I ask? Yeah, I, I think I that mean... brings up. Oh, oh sorry. A uh, great point, Michael. Just for me, you inspired to think like, oh, the moms of all these littler kids that want to see something positive on the screen instead of a bunch of killing and debase things. So, I mean, there are a plethora of markets for sure. Thank you for that insight. I'm sorry to interrupt. Sorry, I just wanted to ask uh, Irina, um, what are the utilities of the actual token? We have quite a few things in the works, but currently we are now trading in terms of getting advisory calls like these four advisors here we've got from our marketplace. We have other people that promote their own talent so that they can get a gig so people can earn them by participating in our game. We've got a community game. You can earn them by taking on some of these roles that pay you in Exos. And then we also have other people who are starting to develop cross promotion amongst team members like sister economies, which was presented or may, might be coming up, I don't know which one it was, which slide, is that the dream token and the exos token will be accepted by each other's communities. And the seeds probably will be in, in that mix as well. And as we grow to bigger pockets of these, you know, 10 and 20,000 person member networks, we start to have a lot more utility where it can be exchanged for food or the rice or the, you know, anything else. Um, as an example, we used to um, live off grid in Hawaii, and we had seven species of fruit trees, but we had neighbors that grew vegetables, and so we would just swap at the end of the day, 
and we had you know these like little tokenized tokenized kind of books that we would trade amongst ourselves but it was a different way of not relying on commerce and allowing people lowering the barrier of, of entry it, it worked with third world countries it worked with you know elite countries it worked with any kind of economy and so allowing these sorts of exchange to be what you what your abundance is allows you to give and trade and be in community in that way and just letting it be naturally evolving into this holacracy where people just come together to do great things they don't have to be incorporated or even funded they they just have those resources and they just swap amazing have you guys... so we're at oh sorry, sorry. Okay. Go, ahead. I go for it go ahead no no, no, no. Just i just want your just... question Oh, I just Go wanted ahead. to ask more questions about the token. Like, who's designed the the token economy? Is it someone here has designed the token economy? The dreams token or the access? Yeah, the dream the, the, the dream right. token economy. Right. Yeah, the, the Arena dreams and Steven. was uh, was designed by Arena and myself. Okay. And uh, there's it's like a pretty in depth document. Not enough time to go through during this okay. meeting, but um, would would love to chat about it. Uh, I'll shoot you my number. Just give me a call sometime next week. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I would suggest rather than another um, sprint, we actually call this group together again in you know two weeks or something that we can take from what has been inspired and really take it to the next step altogether. Well, I think what happened last year was that the students had to go back to school. <laughs> so we lost not a little yet. bit of the attention span. But right. Had... Not, not so much to design the game itself, but mm -hmm. to get these bigger questions ideated together. Mm -hmm. And is it something that can be integrated into the curriculum of these schools? So when they go back to school, that's action time, where there's an entire you know, team there to support this work as part of the curriculum to yeah. advance education because that's getting stagnant too so how do we yeah all of this right. into the life of of everything because if we're doing it right it's going to be you know fairly simple graceful and abundant for all <laughs> so you know yes let's, thank let's you that. angelique for bringing that up because um actually professor barrett hazeltine who is a Brown University uh, legend in uh, his classes in business and organizational design and problem solving and engineering. He offered access to the design lab at Brown for these students to keep working on it and recruit other students. So, but we, we still would love some sponsorship to help support it, uh, but that's amazing. So we do have the capacity for that and I wonder if you could get course credit for it, uh, students. Uh, that would be even better, huh? Um, I'd also mention that the event on the 24th is um, actually International Education Day. And so that's why we chose that day is to really emphasize the need for mandatory climate education in every school around the planet and, and really push um, governments to include this in their curriculum and you know we are at the the, the leading edge of that yeah, yeah I so I know that we're at the top of the hour uh, but I feel like we didn't just finish maybe one more comment on um, uh, the dreams token arena they did think uh, think through a little bit of the utility for that um, and so maybe you just want to say that and then we can close yeah so yeah let's let's have that i'll i'll finish it up with the dream token and then thanks everyone for joining i know it's been been a long meeting um so and and to kind of bridge everyone's points here michael i think you'll find it interesting as well um Basically, you're you're inventing this new type of of asset class because something like this isn't designed before with the token economy, and it, and it really wraps up every idea into into one token, a dreams token. Um, and so you raise a fund with a token, 
and now this token is going to be distributed to you know cohorts of 10 to 20 startups each one of those startups is going to represent value back to that same fun token the dreams token as well as be used in this metaverse game ecosystem learning to earning playing to earn uh, two metaverse concepts that are pretty popular and so the token is is acting like a liquid investment to to invest in startups now which has never never been done before because when i invest in a startup usually i buy and purchase the startup it either fails or it goes to the moon um, usually not anywhere in between um, so it's highly liquid uh, if i want to get an etf you know definitely there's some etfs that are that are performing very well but uh, none of them have you know startup potential um, if you want to invest in a, a group that actually does this and invest in 20 startups, you got to have a million dollars. Um, so it lowers the barrier to entry to this very unique asset class, wraps all of the tokens and companies into one, you know, fund called the Dreams Token. And I, I think it could be a very revolutionary idea that can, that can spur innovation um because as the tokens increase money is flowing back into the fund all of a sudden this becomes a bigger and bigger flywheel and with each and every cohort this idea can really expand and grow um that being said i'll i'll drop my number here in the chat and feel free to call me about it thank you so much everyone i gotta jump to my next meeting i really appreciate all of you thank you <laughs> And we're just going to bring up on the screen, um, Elizabeth, uh, we just want to say thank you to our partners and sponsors. Uh, are you still there, Elizabeth, or would you like me to I do that? I am. Let me get to that. Okay, screen. great. Just really want to thank the Winterns for their faith in us, for sure. Yes, yes. Let's celebrate you all. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> we're going to miss you. We will be in touch, of course. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going anywhere. We know the where next. you are. <laughs> <laughs> so this um, is these are just the team members and the different um, guests and and team members who mentored were very active during the program. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, just some special kudos to Chris who really came in at the last minute as a as a rescue to really help us bring it to the finish line so yes kudos to chris uh, we had chandra metzler brown alumni and dear friend of mine come and give feedback at the dry run at the run through yesterday it was super helpful and the other uh exo folks who uh were uh giving us uh some incredible feedback along the way Thank you, thank you. And to our sponsors and partners, uh, when you join our DAO, uh, you really, you're bringing your whole self. Uh, we want you, your universe uh, to be activated. So we support your ventures, your projects, we help each other, we collaborate. So these are some of the organizations who have sponsored us financially um, and also invested really time, money, and talent into our DAO. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And there's Exo Angels. Uh, Nikki, I, I think you want to just close. I think you met, were able to mention, is there any additional piece you want to add to this? No, I just close? want everybody to know that this is yet another environment, another example of how companies can either spin off projects or become companies. We literally have a dozen different projects going on, and they all started with the Exos token and our community of finding experts that want to come together and co-create. But I wanted to let you know, Heidi, because in this slide this morning when I got up, it's like you still needed somebody to write the narrative for Dream Tank. So you know who wrote that? <laughs> Yeah, Chat GPT wrote that. No way. It did. Awesome. Oh, Collective I can't wait to read it. That's yep. awesome. Yeah, it's one of our favorite new AI tools we used oh, in the man. sprint. We all got to play. I became a That's game cool. developer myself this uh, during this program. Yep. It's been so fun. Thank you, everyone. Wind turns, do you want to come off uh just camera and just say a closing word of um 
gratitude or greetings and and we wish you the best of luck in your semester. You are part of our DAO uh, anytime, and we will be following up. Oh, here comes Chris. Chris Burke just is coming on to make a oh, cameo. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> we literally were just about to close. We just mentioned him. That's amazing. Yeah, we just <laughs> gave you kudos, sir. Chris, we li literally just were giving you the kudos and uh, we're about to close, so you made a cameo just at the right time. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Chris. It meant so much that you were willing to come in and the way that you did. So, Winterns, uh, you get the final word. <laughs> yeah, I can go. Um, just want to say thank you for the opportunity. This was really fun. It was engaging. Um, I learned a lot about Unity. I learned a lot about C Sharp. Thanks to Chris. Um, so yeah, I had a good time. Um, and yeah, I'll pass it on to whoever wants to go next. Yeah, thank you everyone. It was really nice working on the team of all these talented winters and um uh, I really loved it. Thanks. Yeah, I'll go next. Um, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Um, even though I worked alone and there was a lot of challenges, I ended up learning a lot. So I'm really grateful for that and this experience. So thanks awesome. to everyone. Yeah, thank you all for having us. It was a very interesting two weeks. Um, and yeah, again, thank you to all the people who helped us, Chris especially. It's been a very long week, <laughs> but we got it. We made it as a thank you. Yeah, same thing, honestly. Thank you guys for working with us. And it was amazing working with Winterns. Uh, I loved the experience and yeah, good luck with everything. You guys hit a okay, home run. And with, and with, yes, home run. I wish you could see me right now. I'm jumping up and down. I'm so grateful. And uh, we are going to close by just saying, please join our DAO, fill out the form. We can keep working together. Have a great rest of your Saturday, knowing that hopefully you can rest with more hope that these young people have inspired in you. Uh, that has happened to me every single time I work with work with them and work with young people. So thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. And um, good night. I, I do see that we got somebody that finally got in from Guinea. I just want to uh, thank you for, for that and keeping up. Is that Kareem? Conte. Um, yeah, and, and we'll get you the recording. Thank you for trying so hard to get in. <laughs> I know it's challenging. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. folks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Adios. Adios. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs>